So I'm psyched to have Pat join us for this podcast here. I, I got to know Pat at, uh, at I was going to say Drift, but it's not Drift. <laughs> <laughs> at HubSpot, where we work together. So, uh, so got to work with Pat, and Pat was one of the most thoughtful people that I know. I might not know many people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it? Yeah. What is it about Pat that like what 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 well, makes him thoughtful? A bunch like, of a, a bunch of stuff which you'll figure out. Um, the proof is in the pudding. You'll figure out on the podcast. But um, one of the things that I thought would be interesting to talk about is like um, Pat is relatively young or appears young to me from what <laughs> I can see. Uh, and so like we're this podcast is all about accelerated learning. And so like the I was thinking like how has Pat approached learning? And we were talking about this when you got here about these new markets, and especially as you come into an environment like Sequoia where people might be 20, 30, whatever years ahead, not only in learning, but in terms of like pattern matching, right? They have yeah. history. So how do you accelerate your learning there? Like yeah. that's that's a yeah, thing I, I love that. Talk the about. theme that we talk about a lot is like DC calls it like reps and sets, right? You have to have reps and sets. Like I haven't interviewed nearly as many people as he has, so he'll come out of an interview and know know something already, and I'm trying to figure out like what is it. Yeah. And it's like, well, he's had the reps and sets. Like you've seen this pattern matching over and over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the pattern matching is something that we're very careful about talking about, just because. What, what's interesting in the evolution of a venture investor is mm -hmm. when you're a couple years in, maybe two, three, four, five years in, you start to think that you know something yeah. because you've you've seen enough companies and you've met enough founders mm -hmm. and you've seen stories play out. And thinking that you know something very quickly becomes dangerous yep. because as soon as you think you know something, the next company you see breaks that pattern and you come to learn that like it, it's, it's a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, but it really is true that every company is unique because mm -hmm. a company is nothing more than the collection of people inside the building. Yep all of whom have unique DNA and in combination, all of whom like combine to create very unique outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're really careful about um, using quote unquote pattern matching as anything more than context yep. that we can provide to a founder so they can make their own decision. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So how do you not, how do you not let that bias, like how do you systematically not let that bias sink in, which, which is pattern matching is a bias, right? Like, yeah. Um, you just have to tamp it down I, every time it shows we, up? We, yeah, yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we, we talk a lot about trying to think from first principles because I, I think um, starting a company or being an investor has a lot of scaffolding that's been built up around it over the years, which is useful because in a lot of cases that can help you shortcut to an answer as opposed to have to doing everything from first principles. Um, but I think for us, when we invest in a new company, we're trying to only invest in what we would call sort of fundamental companies, meaning they have a chance to be independent for the next few decades, right? Like they have a chance to completely define a category and dominate that category and show the world something that the world didn't know before they existed. And for those companies, a lot of that scaffolding doesn't really matter because by definition, that scaffolding is conventional wisdom and conventional wisdom builds conventional companies. And so we just try to go back to first principles, like what problem do you solve? Why is that an important problem? Are there really a lot of people who have that problem? And what positions you to solve it in a unique and compelling way that won't be easily rec replicated by everybody else who witnesses your success? Yeah. First principles is like one of these things that is like, it's so logical, like when you hear it, but it's like so hard to, to apply it in the heat of a deal or the heat of battle, the heat of some competition or something like that, especially yeah. in your in your world, right? Everything is competitive, highly yeah. competitive deal. Will like, you explain what, what first principles are in your in your context? Because for us, it's like, uh, you know, cu uh, customer, company, uh, then us. Like, what, are, what does that mean for you from an investment perspective? Yeah, for, first principles for us, um, in the context of a company, it means like if you reduce it to its essence, like, why do companies exist, right? Like, companies don't exist to make people rich, whether those are the founders or the investors or anybody else. Like, companies exist to solve a problem. So for us, the first principle is just, what is the problem you're solving? How do you how do, you do so in a unique and compelling way that has some inherent durability to it? And like, for us, that's those sort of are the first principles. Um, how that translates into sort of going after an investment, um, one of the biggest things we look for is just authenticity in a founder. Because if somebody makes a list, like here are the 100 businesses that maybe I could build, and you know, like I'm gonna try a couple of them, but maybe I'm gonna settle on you know, business number 37, like that's fine, and there are probably a lot of situations where that ends up working out. Um, 
but you might not have the same level of passion in attacking business number 37 as you do as as you do when you attack a problem that like you've actually experienced and it really ticks you off yeah, that, that problem yeah. exists mm -hmm. and you just want to stamp it out of existence <laughs> right like yeah like yeah. that that like the the authenticity with which somebody approaches their whole business i think they can't help but translate that into their employees and into their customers and then you have this groundswell of enthusiasm that kind of propels your business forward. Yep. I know a guy like I know a guy like that. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, Somewhere. I don't know who he is? But. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so, know either. All right. So 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 there's not really pattern matching. So there's not pattern match. Well, there is, but it's not there an important thing for company perspective. What about from a people perspective and a founder perspective? Because like we love talking about people and like who's behind the companies and the the you know personal side of things. Like yeah. are, are there? Can you pattern match on a on a founder level? Um, yes and no. Um, I think, yeah, yes and no, because I think what people talk a lot about product market fit and we think about product market fit, but we also think about founder market fit, meaning a great founder to go after a top down enterprise market probably looks different than a great founder who's going to build a consumer facing application. Um, and sometimes there are enterprise markets where that consumer facing application founder is actually better because you want to have frictionless bottoms up distribution, not 42 longs, you know, parachuting into the CIO office. <laughs> and so we, 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 we try to spot people who um, are a fit for the market that they're going after. And then I think we'd layer on top of that um, outlier characteristics, mm -hmm. which generally has some component of drive and ambition associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we try to layer on top of that I guess I would call it moral compass or mm -hmm. ethics mm -hmm. or cultural sensitivity. Yep. Because if you have somebody who is not intentional about the culture that they're building and mm -hmm. the values that they represent as an organization, there's going to be some point at which Problems. the entropy starts to take over mm -hmm. and the organization starts to break. Mm -hmm. And so we always try to look for that too. That's interesting. Oh. And so how do you, so you must have a weird problem at Sequoia and that your your funnel is like kind of maybe the biggest funnel or <laughs> infinite, right? Right. And so like at the top. And so, but you know, there's only a handful of companies that you're going to bet on in a given year. I don't know what that handful is. Like, so like you must have the highest order, like filtering problem. Like, and so how do you, yeah. Yeah. It's well, the biggest it's, and smallest funnel. Like, yeah. It's the biggest. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be a very good marketing website, like all the traffic and then very small. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And our, and our rough, I don't know what it is from lead to investment, but from first meeting to investment, it's about 500 to one. Um, <laughs> That's unreal. To give you a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's really interesting about this. So I joined Sequoia at the beginning of 2007. And I think at the time we had call it a dozen investors. Yeah. And today I think we have 19 investors. And so we've grown by roughly mm -hmm. 50% mm -hmm. in terms of investors. Yeah. Yes. Our funnel has probably grown by more than 10x. Crazy. Because over those 10 years, mm -hmm. like everyone, you know, there's so many companies and exactly. technology. And Everybody's starting a company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a persistent trend. Yeah. So one of the things that we've been grappling with over the last handful of years is this constant need to reinvent our own business, not just in terms of who's inside the building, but yep. also in terms of how do we operate? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we use technology to our advantage yeah. so that the methods that Don Valentine used in the 1970s and 1980s yeah. are not the same methods that we're mm -hmm. using today? Like, we want to benefit from all of that tribal wisdom, mm -hmm. but we want to also reinvent constantly so that we can deal with that funnel problem. So we actually have, we have a team of really talented engineers and data scientists and- Who work um, on your funnel? Who work on who work on automating as much of that as possible. That's from amazing. <laughs> identifying, filtering, yeah. coordinating, mm -hmm. providing leverage to investors. Like yeah. we're, we've we've got we've got so much room to to mm -hmm. to, to run. Yep. Um, and we feel like we're just in the you know first inning of of sort of um, reinventing our own business with technology. Mm -hmm. But it's something we think about all the time. It's crazy. How often are they How often are they surfacing things to you before you've heard uh, of them? Um. That's a good question. Um, a lot of times it's resurfacing, meaning it might be a company that we intersected a couple years ago and didn't get into business with for whatever reason. And they've started to take off and mm -hmm. like we were asleep at the switch. Mm -hmm. And somebody in our technology organization finds it. Yep. Um, but uh, we've actually made an investment in the last 12 months as a direct result of our data science efforts, where they surfaced something that like we'd heard of, but we yeah. weren't really keyed into Tracking. how important it was. Yeah, um, and they're producing 
good leads for us every week. That's crazy. That's awesome. And so uh, in the show notes, I'm going to have a link to a YouTube video of a talk that Dan, uh, Don Valentine did at, oh, nice. at Stanford at GSB. It's amazing. I think I've watched it like seven times. Was this the uh, Target Big Markets? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so I yeah. have to. It's one of those talks that I need to keep revisiting all the time. I'm just like, let me watch this one more time. Don is amazing. You, you want to talk about first principles thinking. Don yeah. Valentine is it's just so is simple. Canonical fill, fill example. In, fill of people first in who are going to listen and be like, who's that? And yeah. what was this talk? Uh, Don Valentine was the founder of Sequoia okay. in 1972. Yeah. Um, what was interesting about Don was he was not a financier. You mm. know, he was a chief marketing officer at a yeah. time when marketing went yeah. meant everything associated with going to market. Mm -hmm. And so the the founding premise of Sequoia was uh, was Don just saying, "Boy, I'm surrounded by all these brilliant engineers who yeah. know how to build great stuff." They don't necessarily market. know how to connect it to human problems. <laughs> and it's like that was the genesis of our business. And that's kind of been what we've tried to stay true to over the last 45 years. That's amazing. So that goes back to the authentic founders, right? The yeah. big markets. And then he talks about this thing of just like target big markets, right? Just like it's so fundamental. I mean, I'm doing it injustice. You have to watch it. And he's funny uh, in the way that he delivers it. But like that, it's a thing that we always forget. Yeah. All entrepreneurs forget is just like the importance of targeting big markets. Well, I mean, it's, it's tricky though. And it's, it's, and, so it's and it's a little bit dangerous because mm -hmm. I think anymore you don't target a big market from time zero. No. You yeah. target a very, very narrow, narrow slice market. of a big market and yeah. you earn the right to evolve your way into more of it over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And so I think like for us as investors, one of the mistakes that we make, one of the most common mistakes we make is we underestimate or underappreciate what a market can become yep. when things start to work. Yeah. And as a result, we just don't realize how exciting a business is the mm -hmm. first time we see it. Yeah, it's something we talk about internally all the time. It's just like, it's our own go-to-market. It's just like wedge. We got to start something with something that is like easy, simple, everyone can integrate it. It's non-threatening, right? Yeah. Non-threatening is the word that we use. And then that wedge over time gives us the ability to maybe rethink all this other stuff. Yeah. But we're capturing a tiny little wedge in the beginning and then expanding over time. doesn't mean that we don't have a big vision for where we're trying to go, but we need to find that little crack to get inside. Yeah. That's non-rip and replace, non-threatening, not just fits right in there. Well, in the, we the wedge that you talk about a lot, it doesn't start, it actually starts big and then you get to the wedge, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you love the whole um, uh, invert, right? Mm -hmm. Invert all the problems, invert the problems, invert the challenges that we have and then say, okay, that's the big problem. But what's the easiest path to, for us to maybe get into a, into that market or into mm -hmm. that company? And that's mm -hmm. how we started small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find your way into investing? A boy Ooh. from Wyoming. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. So, um, so I went to Boston College and BC, BC, yeah. what's up? Go Eagles. <laughs> a lot of love out there. Yeah. Go Eagles. And so while I was at BC, I actually started as a physics major and I was, I started as physics and finance and the rationale was That's I like weird. math. That's weird. <laughs> I liked math and it seemed like business and science were two yeah. places that you could apply math. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and as I went on through, through school, I ran into physics lab and it just drove me crazy that like the math yeah. you could do didn't necessarily work in the lab. Yep. Yeah. And so I, so I dropped physics and ended up with uh, finance, econ and, and math. Mm -hmm. And um, so all the vent, all the places that math can, the Venn diagram of math. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and so I, I went into business, um, I went into investing right out of college and, mm. and I guess at the time, like kind of naively thought mm. that math was going to play a big part in it, which it turns out it plays almost no part whatsoever. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's great to hear. But what yeah. really intrigued me about yeah. it was uh, finance and econ kind of sets you down this path of mm -hmm. the investment world writ large, whether yeah. that's banking or working for a mutual fund or a hedge mm -hmm. fund or whatever the case might be. And within that world, it seemed like working with founders mm -hmm. was at um, the very far end of the spectrum yeah. in terms of things that you could feel good about and mm -hmm. kind of tell your grandma what you do yeah. and have her say like, oh, you help small companies like yeah. make their customers happy mm -hmm. and hire great employees. That yeah. sounds good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's what drew me to it originally. And I, I, so I was an investor straight out of school in Versus Boston for a few years. We yeah. extracted. I was at a, yeah. I was at a private equity slash venture capital firm yep. in Boston, and um, and then moved to Sequoia at the beginning of 2007 mm -hmm. because I think Sequoia more so than almost any other organization out there mm -hmm. has prided itself over the years mm -hmm. on starting with founders who are like really at ground zero yeah. and trying to wrap as many resources around them as possible. Mm -hmm to maximize the likelihood that their idea is going to have the biggest possible impact. Yeah. And that's um, another part I loved about Don's talk about when he was talking about 
uh, Jerry from Yahoo and like basically how they basically targeted the those those early founders and kind of like built around them. Yeah, right? like that's a great part. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Have you met? Have you? Is he still Don around? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Don. Um. So Don Don spends most of his time in Arizona these days. Okay. Um. But he's in the office every couple of months and that's crazy like he'll he'll still drop in on a partner meeting from time to time <laughs> don, don, check it in on you don, don is amazing i mean he that's crazy still his he will sit he will sit without saying a word for mm -hmm. two or three hours mm -hmm. and he won't talk unless somebody asks him for his opinion yeah um but if you ask him for his opinion like inevitably you will get 10 words or less yeah that are more insightful than anything else that was said in the yeah. preceding three hours. Those are people that I love. He's incredible. Yeah. Just quiet and then just like, wow, how did he say that in 10 words? Yeah. I had That's a incredible. question that I wanted to ask you that I just, when you, how did you, so you, you get this job at Sequoia. Did, did you reach out to like, what is the actual process for you to get from Boston <laughs> yeah, yeah. to Sequoia? People are listening. They want, yeah, yeah. They want to know yeah. the process. Yeah, they want to know. Well, so... Um, Secret process. Yeah, yeah the, the truth matters. matter is I got really, really lucky in a couple of different ways. One was uh, in 2006, we decided that we were going to start amping up our focus on growth stage investments. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we actually got into that business in 1987, yep. but it was kind of a side business for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2006, we looked around and said, well, geez, you know, a lot of these companies that we get into business with at the early stages mm -hmm. um, start to grow up and then like would prefer to work with us as opposed exactly. to working with other folks. Mm -hmm. And also there are plenty of companies that are started outside of the Bay Area where we're not as good at supporting companies mm -hmm. at the very earliest stage yep. that we'd love to intersect at a growth stage, mm -hmm. right? So 2006, we started kind of amplifying this focus on the growth stage business, which meant hiring a dedicated team. Yep. And it turned out that the place I worked in Boston was one of the kind of early category defining firms mm -hmm. around growth stage investing. investing. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was sort of in the right place at the right time in terms of what Sequoia was targeting. Yep. Um, and then, and then how I got the job was, uh, I think I, um, uh, my very first interview was with Doug Leone, who uh, at the time was responsible for the growth business in addition yeah. to a bunch of other stuff. And today is responsible for all of Sequoia globally. Yep. yep. And I think I had a I think I had a good breakfast with Doug, and he kind of just. <laughs> so the it, secret is there. Good yeah, breakfast. Yeah. Doug Doug just kind of ran around, and and I think he, I'm I'm not convinced that anybody else likes me as much as yeah, Doug did. He, he kind of paved the way, and so <laughs> that's so, amazing. So, so he I, put I a got, good word in. After so I got breakfast. a shot. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. That's awesome. I love that. I love those stories. We all have those stories. Yeah. There, just like random, right? Yeah. I have a similar story of like how I got my. Uh, it was CRV at the time, but like how we got our first investment, my first company was just like, oh, I think I hired someone. I'm pretty sure I hired someone that this investor was trying to hire and they chose me over them. And so that's why, that's why. <laughs> that was it. I think that's it. That's the only nice. pattern. Which was company like, was this? This was at Compete. I had hired someone, at, I had hired someone away that this investor was trying to learn to one of their companies. And he's retired now and uh, this investor, but I think that was it. Yeah. Yep. I can't explain it any other way. Yep. Yeah. That's it's awesome. Amazing. It's crazy. So w does growth operate separate at Sequoia now? Or very, no? very tightly integrated. Very so, tightly integrated. So I mentioned we, the model for everyone has been all over the map. Some people are totally separate on growth. Some yeah. people try to integrate some people. Yeah, well, so it's, it's very tightly integrated. And I mentioned we have 18 or 19 investors. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. everybody who does early stage and to, growth to stage growth. investing. Yeah. Um, and the reason it's tightly integrated, a um, couple of reasons. One is the spec for both businesses is kind of the same. Like we're looking for companies that have a chance to just define and dominate a category over a really long period of time. And it doesn't matter whether we intersect them when it's a person with an idea or a team of several hundred people that is going to go public in the next 12 months, right? Like anywhere within that range, like the business is the business. We just happen to be intersecting them at different points along that spectrum. Um, the reason we have dedicated teams is the decision criteria for a seed or series A is very different than the decision for a growth stage investment when there are, there are a bunch of unit economics and yep. a bunch of financials yeah. and you know valuation and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the decisions are a little bit different, but what we look for in the company is the same. Mm -hmm. And then also a lot of the company building itself is the same. Yep. Um, like a growth stage investment, there's a lot of DNA that's already taken shape. Mm -hmm. 
but we tend to get involved with growth stage companies around that like 150 ish, you know, Dunbar's number. Yep. Um, yeah. Employee Dunbar's number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is where everything kind of starts to break, mm -hmm. and where a lot of the VPs who got you there yeah. start to top out. And so there's so there's a there is still a lot of um, kind of a lot of uh, a, a lot of things that people look toward us to help with as yeah. the company scales. And the fact that we do a lot of that in our early stage business um, uh, really helps with the growth stage business in terms of just sharing sharing some of those tricks of the yeah. trade. It's funny because we've talked about that in the in past episodes of like there are these magic breaking point numbers in yeah. companies that uh, it's hard to, unless you experience them, for some reason it's hard to explain. You cannot explain why these happen, but the, the magic like breaking points of yeah. every company that I've been at that they seem yeah. to start to break at the same point we, in terms we, of uh, headcount. We had an awesome interview with Patty McCord, who ran oh, yeah. uh, you know, Netflix yeah, she, uh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. She was, and she had an amazing thing that that has I can't stop thinking about it. Is um, we asked her like, okay, we're right around fifty, you know, employees now. You know, by the time you talk to us next, we'll be 100, 200 plus. Like, what advice would you give? And her advice was like, don't get caught up in nostalgia. Nostalgia can, can be the number one thing that'll, that'll kill you. And that is like employees that were there early being like, oh, I wish it was like how it used to be. Well, and so that's like, people. that's a really yeah. interesting topic that's like very top of mind for us right now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think those magic numbers exist? Uh, that's a good question. I think I'm the, hoping for an answer because I, yeah. <laughs> I don't have one. I don't know why they, well, I just say they do. I think like 150 in particular, um, for, for anybody who's not familiar with Dunbar's number, yep. right? Like it's basically the number of reasonably close human connections any given individual is capable of having and mm -hmm. keeping track of. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to a company in the sense that 150 employees is right around where that like inherent inherent ambient knowledge of what's happening yeah. begins to dissipate yeah. and it's overwhelmed by the coordination costs mm -hmm. of keeping 150 people on the same page. And so I think w when there are 10 people in a room, mm -hmm. And you know you can hear everything that's happening. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to know that there's a clear and co not very easy. I shouldn't trivialize it. It's still hard. It's yeah. just comparatively easier yeah. to have a shared vision mm -hmm. about where the company's headed mm -hmm. and a shared understanding of how you're going to get there at yeah. least over the next you know weeks or months mm -hmm. or quarters. Um, and 150 employees, like you start to not know everybody's name, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. The employees who joined recently might have a totally different idea of why the company exists yep. and where you're hoping to get. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can solve that is through systems and mm -hmm. culture. And so it's the point at which like having actual management systems in place, yep. and I mean systems in the sense of technology, but also in the mm -hmm. sense of a regular cadence, mm -hmm. you know, around meetings and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and then culture in the sense that at that point, if you're not intentional about your culture, it starts to get away from you. Yep. That's funny. Patty yesterday said, like, uh, she asked, like, are you at the, are you still at the stand on the table phase where you can stand up on the top of the table and address everyone in the company? Or you pass the stand on the table phase, which is That's very a good much way this. to put it. And it's definitely why we're spending, a, I'm spending a lot of time in Elias, co founder, on starting to document a bunch of this stuff and getting, figuring out how we do onboarding and all that kind of stuff. Cause, come 12 months, we'll be hitting that Dunbar number or past that number, yeah. right? And so we need to be ready now of how we're going to train people. And, and I, even now when we're having like seven people starting at a time and that kind of thing. Well, and I think the thing that I think that you guys, the two of you are, are obsessed with is like, just because maybe something marketing related is in my head or something sales related is in Armin's head or whatever, like that doesn't do anybody any good for the next wave of the company, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's on paper and it's documented and it's part of the onboarding process. It's like part of a process. It becomes a, a checklist and mm -hmm. the whole like, you know, we're obsessed with the Bill Walsh uh, book standard, uh, you know, how he talks about the standard of performance yeah. and how he ran the 49ers. Like just having those checklists and having that process up front <laughs> is such an important thing that, yep. like, you know, you guys are obsessed with that. And now it's like, how do we actually you know, put that into play. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so since you look at so many companies, what would be your advice to budding, young budding entrepreneurs about how to think about their companies? About how to think about their company just in general? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's like, a, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's there. Uh, in the in today's context, like how they should, so let's take a SaaS company, for example, not yeah. a, not a, you know, scientific risk kind of company, but like just yeah. like a market risk company, like, like someone in SaaS or some yeah. kind of yeah, software, yeah. like how would you be thinking about that category now or that type of company now versus five years ago? Like what are the risks? Um, good question. So 
I guess, broadly speaking, and then maybe I'll zoom in on SaaS a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, broadly speaking, like we've been in the same basic technology cycle since 2001 now. Yep. And so we're called 16 to 17 years in. Mm -hmm. And historically, these cycles have followed kind of 14, 15 year patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in some ways, we're kind of overdue for the end of this cycle and the beginning of the next. Mm -hmm. And what that means for a founder generally mm -hmm. is that the, um, uh, what we would call the Verrucht period, uh, Verrucht is a German word, which mm -hmm. means sort of insanity or craziness. <laughs> um, what, what, what Don Valentine would have called the good theater that good comes theater. at the end of a cycle. Yeah. Um, the Verrucht period is probably coming close to an end. And that mm -hmm. could be tomorrow, that could be five years from now, yeah. right? Um, but it's probably coming close to an end. And the way that translates into the advice that we give a founder is like, don't get caught up in the hype. Like, mm -hmm. don't try to chase the unicorn logo. Mm -hmm. Don't raise infinite amounts of money, money. just because it's available. Yep. Yeah. Like, just try to stick to first principles because mm -hmm. if your employees actually care about your mission, yep. and if your customers like are going to buy your products mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not their budget is big or small, yep. you're in a good spot. Mm -hmm. And so we would actually encourage people in most cases to raise less money as opposed to more. Okay. Um, to be very deliberate about the hiring and try to stay away from the people who respond to the line, you know, we're a fast growing pre IPO uh. company <laughs> and go after the people who respond to the line like, you know, this we care about solving this problem. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but we mm -hmm. think it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. If you agree, you should join us. Yep. Right? I'm um, going to change our job descriptions. Yeah. For that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I think for SaaS specifically, that's um, that's also true because five years ago, there was still a reasonably uh, decent amount of white space yes. in SaaS yeah. just in terms of like buying centers within the enterprise that, that were underserved mm -hmm. um, or SMBs for that matter that were underserved. Mm -hmm. And I think today there's less white space. And so the companies that are cracking through are the companies that have come up with something that's truly a superior value proposition. Either mm -hmm. it's more usable or it's more pervasive or it's yep. more intelligent or mm -hmm. whatever the case might be. Um, and, and I don't think you can sort of brute force your way into scale today mm -hmm. the way that maybe you could five, six, seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Today mm -hmm. there's just more competition. You know, everybody's got plenty of money. Yep. And we're kind of back to the basics of like find the magic of product market fit mm -hmm. and, and kind of iterate from there. Mm. Those are wise words wise for you words. entrepreneurs out well, there. Easier said than done. I know. <laughs> Everything is easier said than done. That is true. That is awesome. We got to ask Pat about learning before we go. Okay. Do you read a lot? I do. When do you, like, tell us, when, when do you read? What are you reading now? Like, maybe, and, and books you recommend the most to people. Great question. Um, when do I read and what am I reading now? Well, anytime I travel, I end up getting a lot of good reading in. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I do mostly read books as opposed to reading you know newsletters and that yes. sort of thing. Um, Good man. Just because I find I'll scan a bunch of different newsletters to try to get an, an awareness of what's happening in the mm -hmm. world, but I get a lot more out of spending an hour reading one thing and really understanding it than I do out of snacking on fifteen different things mm -hmm. you know over the same period of time. Um, Love that. So books, books that are worth reading. Well, we were just talking about extreme ownership uh, oh, yeah. before Yo. we got on. Mm -hmm. I, I know that the listeners of, of your podcast have heard yeah. plenty about that, so, <laughs> so I won't. Uh, we love it. I won't beat it. We to love that. it. Um, so actually, the guy, my partner Kevin Slump at Sequoia, is the one who recommended extreme ownership to me, and um, he was also the one who recommended a book called Boys in the Boat. Oh yes, yeah, good one. Great one. Which, yeah, it, the thing that I love about Boys in the Boat is actually towards the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And for people who aren't familiar, Boys in the Boat is about the 1936 U.S. Uh, men's uh, rowing team, yep. which uh, went to the Olympics in Germany. This was a team consisting of a bunch of people from the middle of nowhere yep. who really like had no right to be yeah. in the Olympics, mm -hmm. but they just fought like heck yeah. and came together in the toughest of moments to, uh, you know, to earn their way there. But the best part of the book is towards the end where they're reflecting on what happened in the 1936 Olympics. Mm -hmm. Um, and at this point, the guys are 50, 60 yeah. years old and they're just, they do reunions every now and then. And at one of these reunions, they realized that for the eight men in the boat, every single one of them thought that he was the weakest link. That's awesome. And every single one of them mm -hmm. fought like heck mm -hmm. because he didn't want to let the other guys down. That's awesome. And I, I think that is just the, the ultimate statement yeah. of high performance culture mm -hmm. And what we love to see in our own partnership yeah. 
or in the companies that we're getting into business mm. with. Chills. So you got goosebumps. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thanks, Pat, for joining us. Thank Before you. Before you leave, uh, hit up Pat on social media. Yeah. We'll have links to him on social media. Yeah. Follow him. Do you tweet? Yeah. You do? I he tweet has a tweeter. Occasionally. He's he has a tweeter. tweeter. Yeah, I he's tweet a tweeter every couple yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, check out Sequoia. I bet you know them already. And leave us a six star review. <laughs> Apple will only allow <laughs> us five stars so far, Fun, but we're so, going six so stars. So tonight we're going out to dinner with a bunch of. Uh, uh, people that we want to be customers and customers. One of them just replied to me on the way down here and she said, can't wait for dinner tonight. Six stars only. <laughs> That's it. Six stars only. And in the in your review, leave a little story about Pat or a tip for Pat or a book recommendation yeah. for Pat and Perfect. we'll make sure he gets it. Thanks. Love it. Thank Thanks, you, Pat. Awesome.